joining. A uh, big welcome for everybody joining around the world. I, I love to do these uh, talks a little bit too much sometimes. My passion getting the better of my good sense around my time, but it is really fun to do these things. I want to thank everybody for coming out at RSA uh, this year. We had a really cool uh, line of demos, a uh, presentation on embedded hacking again uh, this year, which always seems to be uh, really popular. We uh, were able to go and hack into some industrial control systems and uh, basically blow them up on stage. So anytime we can get a big boom and a, a nice visual, we're always happy about And It did some cool stuff on uh, Samsung TV and um, a knockbox. So it was uh, really interesting stuff. I'm sure the videos are up. Uh, if not, they'll be up soon. So thanks for everybody going there. And uh, if you didn't, uh, the videos will be up soon. Now, what we want to do with this particular session, and we do have a lot of content, so I'll try and uh, get to Shane pretty quickly. But um, we are we hear a lot about APTs, advanced persistent threats, and we want to break it down a little bit for you in a different way. Um, well, for those of you who have been tracking and following Hacking Exposed over the good 14 years or so that the book has been out, you'll know that you know none of the attacks that we see today are, well, I wouldn't say none. I would say 99% of the attacks we see today are certainly not advanced. I mean, if you, unless you consider you know, vintage 1990s information about security and hacking, how bad guys get in as advanced. And then, uh, you know, persistence, at the end of the day, we, who really cares if the data leaves and if, if they're able to uh, get in again in the future, persistence really doesn't matter. Um, but uh, we'll look at that in, in the context of these APTs. But then also, lastly, is traditional threats and what's been included in APTs is not always the, the full sum of the problem and, and the, the concern. And so we're going to challenge you to think a little bit differently about the threats. And rather than look for just O days and single days, look for forever days and infinite days and features of operating systems and applications as yet very healthy vectors of attack. So without further ado, let's uh, talk about a little bit about the structure. So within Hacking Expose, if you haven't attended one of these, it's pretty straightforward. Basically trying to hack stuff up, trying to show you how we do it, and show you how to uh, prevent the bad guys from getting in. We try and do it monthly or so, which usually means every couple months. And uh, we do have discussion at the end. So if you have questions, you can kind of tee them up throughout the presentation. And then we'll get to them at the very end and start to answer them live for you. Uh, we often try and do demos as live as possible. Sometimes they're videos of demos. Sometimes they're live. And um, you know, we usually leave about 10, 15 minutes for those Q&A. And hopefully we'll get to that as well. And we do really love to hear from you guys if you have cool uh, topics, ideas for topics. Uh, we'll definitely try and track those and get those included into the queue. And I often try and bring in guest presenters, not just folks that are advisors and employees here at, at Silence, but also outside partners and just really super smart people. Uh, I don't really care who they are, where they come from. Um, they just got to be smart and kind of provide some value to you guys. Um, so I appreciate you joining. And then this is recorded. Um, we have about a two-day lag between when it's recorded and when it goes up live. So just check back in a couple of days to make sure that you guys can get it. All right, so let's talk about the word advanced in the advanced persistent threat. As I mentioned uh, in the opening, if you have this first vintage edition of Hacking Exposed version 1, first edition, which published in 1999. I started writing this at InfoWorld um, when I was neck deep in a lot of uh, hacks and vulnerabilities and discovering a lot of vulnerabilities in uh, Windows in particular, and also on the network, network-based vulnerabilities. And uh, we started, uh, you know, I said, hey, I got to put something together that kind of documents a lot of this work and how the bad guys are thinking. And so we built uh, anatomy of a hack, and this was my brainchild to say, hey, there is a process and methodology to this. Let's document it. Let's get it understood, and let's try and build countermeasures and ways to prevent or at least slow down and deter the bad guys in each of these steps. So as you look at what most people would define as advanced persistent threats, there really has nothing substantive has, has changed, really. 
In fact, the only thing, if you were to look at this particular flow diagram, the only thing that's really been added per se is the prolific use of zero days in this particular workflow. But if you know the Hacking Split series well, of course, you know that we talk about zero days and the likelihood of that and a lot of the ones that have come out over the years in the book as well. Uh, so Hacking Exposed in its seventh edition now, um, really cool chapters on things like APTs and embedded as well. All right, without uh, further ado, let's go ahead and to bring in Shane here on the discussion. Shane, why don't you uh, give a quick background on yourself and let's just dive right in in terms of, of what we're going to talk about. Yeah, thanks, Stu. So uh, Shane Shook, I'm uh, happy to say that I've joined Stu and the team at Silance. Uh, I was previously an advisor and I've known Stu for several years. Um, I've been uh, working on APT and other InfoSec uh, issues for uh, a little over, I guess, a little over 16 years, uh, longer if you consider uh, the further experience in the military. Uh, in particular, the last four or five years, I've been really focused on uh, what is being termed the advanced persistent threat. Um, I like to really consider it more the uh, persistent risks, uh, part part that come from the uh, outside world, part that come from inside operations and companies. And uh, I found it's useful to uh, get a context of understanding around both in order to uh, identify emerging threats that result. Uh, we spent some time putting this uh, presentation together uh, for today's uh, webinar. We want to talk about some current uh, attacks and emerging threats that are related to those uh, and point out um, how, as uh, Stu mentioned, uh, there's not a lot new under the sun in terms of uh, the vectors and methods that they're using. Uh, a term of art that's thrown around a lot is TTPs that are tools, tactics, and procedures. We see some uh, evolution in the uh, tactics to some extent, particularly in the last uh, uh, six months uh, or eight months, seeing the use of uh, sabotage uh, that had not been as widely used since at least 2002. Um, but today, what we're dealing with um, uh, in the uh, tactics, uh, probably the biggest evolution is in the early stages of advanced persistent threat uh, activities. Um, the uh, kill chain, as it's called, as it relates to uh, APT, uh, includes um, a series of activities that over time and through the behaviors that are exhibited uh, demonstrate um, uh, malicious activities from persistent actors intent on uh, stealing information or manipulating the environment uh, to the customer's detriment. Um, I generally break those activities down into three broad categories, the first being what I call stage one, which is the um, compromise, initial compromise activities, uh, stage two being generally the um, reconnaissance activities that occur after the initial compromise um, uh, has been achieved. And then stage three, the more persistent, longer-term focused and specific activities intent on disrupting or, or um, harming uh, uh, a customer in some way, whether it be financial, economic, market, or brand, uh, or more malicious. What we, uh, what we see is an emerging uh, threat trend um, related to uh, malware risks, at least, and the risk of um, internet-based internet attacks is the concept of pay-for-play or malware as a service, uh, where in the stage one and to some extent the stage two uh, compromise and reconnaissance activities, much of that work has been farmed out to service providers. And there's been uh, quite a bit of information written up by uh, people like uh, Dantra uh, or um, Brian Krebs. And, uh, we're seeing more confluence uh, between the uh, botnet operators and the persistent actors um, when we look into the events in our investigations uh, such that the initial compromises uh, are not being spawned by the same actors that are later stealing information. And we think it's important to bring this up uh, because, uh, unfortunately, we often come across uh, mistakes in analysis uh, 
by, uh, by customers or um, other analysts uh, who base their assumptions on the actor groups on compromise or early reconnaissance efforts uh, rather than on um, uh, the more persistent activities. So we'll talk a little bit about the, the differences in, on how to detect those kinds of activities. Um, another emerging trend is the use of waterhole attacks uh, in place of fishing. Fishing, of course, is still a very popular uh, method of uh, compromise, uh, but a little more social engineering goes in today into the waterhole attacks. Uh, where sites of interest to certain uh, industry segments uh, are being harnessed uh, for compromise, uh, whether it be Facebook uh, with certain groups or the New York Times or um, other uh, uh, general media, more specific media sites that industry segments rely on for information or other types of news are, are becoming a, a preferred method of social engineering to gain access to um, at least industry segments. The other uh, emerging trend that's useful to bring out is that old is new. Um, we're seeing consistent use of Java exploits, uh, other application exploits. Um, we see the uh, continued evolution and, and unfortunate um, expansion of attacks in ICS because of uh, what we call uh, forever day um, vulnerabilities. Uh, where systems cannot be patched, per se, but have to be uh, drop shipped replaced. Uh, we see the con continued use of remote administrative tools. Um, we're seeing new uses uh, going back 10 years uh, in tactics to uh, renewed use of the startup folders as a persistence mechanism. Uh, similarly, we're seeing an old technique, uh, DLL path hijacking. Uh, and we're seeing because it's available AT and WMI uh, use by malware authors for automation uh, or by um, attackers uh, for manipulated use of the environment. Um, I think in the context of the discussion it's important to uh, uh, differentiate risks and threats. Um, I deal with this as a consultant continuously with customers because uh, the industry at large likes to focus on indicators of compromise, uh, which are merely uh, methods of identifying potential risks that can affect a business. So we read uh, published reports about IP addresses, uh, fully qualified or top-level domains uh, that have hosted malicious communications, uh, malware binary signatures like MD5s or file names and paths. And those are all great in our technical community to communicate amongst ourselves as indicators of compromise, but they mean a lot less to the CFO or the board of directors and unfortunately uh, can be sensationalized in a way that can um, uh, impede uh, our technical capabilities to really help companies deal with actual threats of manipulated use of their environment or behavioral anomalies. I thought this uh, comic was, uh, was pretty on point. So I just want to point out that it's really not a threat unless you can communicate management with management in a way that they can understand that it's a threat. Yeah, and that's what I was talking about earlier, I think, in teeing up the day here, is that you know we traditionally think of threats as just a, uh, an indicator of compromise or a finding or a vulnerability or some way in. And of course, as we've learned over the years and decades, it really doesn't mean much of anything. Um, all those things are just potential risks given the level of acceptance and comfort for the organization to accept it, um, as well as really where it's going, what it's getting, um, you know, the true impact to the business. And I, I think that's what's really important to remember as you go forward and look at these kind of threats and discover these kinds of compromises already in your organization. Yeah. On the topic of uh, risks, um, just another, just another zero day is a term that's getting thrown around uh, in the, the press, and I think it's um, positive that it's getting deflated a little bit as a concept. Um, uh, Deep End Research put a, a nice chart together, which I replicated here, um, and it only goes through about the uh, third quarter of 2012, but you can see that um, the number of CVEs and exploits uh, uh, 
that have uh, developed and evolved over time uh, is growing. And actually, you could probably double the numbers uh, that are listed in the 2012 block on the bottom of this image uh, for the last quarter of 2012 and add that much again since uh, the beginning of 2013. Yeah, the Java exploitation seems to be really ramping up. Yeah, here too. It's. Uh, yeah, I'll come to this a little bit later, but uh, the issue of single days is uh, is actually a persistent threat uh, in the uh, that needs to be handled by organizations internally. It comes back to their ability to change, uh, their willingness to change, and um, to some extent, their vendors' support for that change. Uh, talking about uh, stage one and stage two activities, as I mentioned, the uh, malware as a service is a uh, is a platform. It's a service available today that many companies uh, are experiencing the results of. It's not really necessary today to um, SQL exploit uh, a, a web server uh, or cross site scripting uh, uh, attack um, a website or fish or variety of other things, if you can just log on to a, a, a site that offers you however many systems you want in your target of choice at a, a price that's reasonably affordable. And unfortunately, that's become something of a standard. Um, if, if I wanted to uh, identify a, a number of computers at a particular company in a region that serve a pur purpose, um, it, because of the uh, broad uh, install base of the various botnets today uh, that are still unresolved, uh, it's possible. Talking about watering hole attacks, um, this is just a simple diagram that Symantec put together and was repeated in uh, Wired uh, online, talking about the uh, Elderwood group and their use of watering hole attacks. Uh, What's, what's interesting, uh, there's a quote that the, remar the most remarkable thing, as you see, about the attackers, in this case, they're talking about Elderwood Group, uh, who uh, Symantec wrote about, um, was the number of zero-day vulnerabilities that they burned through. And um, in the last webinar that we did together, I pointed out that, um, or, or Stu pointed out maybe, that uh, zero days uh, are not really the biggest uh, threat of malware out there. It's more the single days uh, because everyone knows about a single day. And when you burn a zero day, it becomes a single day. Uh, people know it's available and there are tools that are made available to uh, exploit it. Um, so it's very interesting. This is an example of a single day that's become a, uh, recognized as a forever day vulnerability. Unfortunately, much of the um, ICS spectrum of equipment, whether it be um, industry ICS, such as oil and gas or other utilities operate, or facilities ICS that many people overlook, uh, things like your power management systems on your um, operating locations or your data centers, uh, your uh, fire suppression systems, uh, health and safety or, or security alarms, um, or other types of building control systems, uh, they, they still in a sense qualify as ICS, and they're largely as vulnerable as the types of applications that were written about by Project Basecamp. And similarly uh, susceptible to very simple compromises. Yeah, this I can't kind of emphasize enough to keep every, on everybody's radar. When we go into clients and we have, and we do our kind of ICS enumeration, we can find 10, 15, upwards of 20% of all of their addressable IP ranges are somehow connected or relatable to industrial control type of softwares and systems, embedded systems, things that there really is no simple way to patch other than full refreshes or recalls of devices. And that is the big challenge in this world, is that you can't just push out a patch through SCCM or Civilly or something of that nature. Um, this requires your boots on the ground, you know, tons of people, the manpower required to go after and fix is, is just prohibitive. So 
if, you know, if, finding these if, things ahead of time. Yeah, if you can, yeah, of course, yeah, if. Um, and finding these things ahead of time is really the key. It's finding the vulnerabilities beforehand, before uh, bad guys know about them, and it's getting um, vendors to patch them, and then getting mitigating controls in place to, to mitigate the risk. Does Steve want to talk a little bit about the advanced threat hunting? Uh, yeah, well? yeah, sure. You know, we we often get asked, okay, so w where do you go about trying to affect the greatest, reduce the greatest amount of risk in your environment when you talk about APTs? And I always bring up this type of a slide where you know, there's basically three phases. You have kind of a reconnaissance phase, um, a, a penetration phase, and then a damage phase. And you know, on the reconnaissance, it's the same old stuff as you see anywhere in, in Hacking Exposed uh, or any book thereafter. You have in, in the penetration phase, of course, an exploitation piece where you're either exploiting, like in a water hole in case, you're exploiting somebody, a uh, third party, that will then push for you, the bad guy, um, payloads, uh, JavaScript, HTML payloads that will then download particular malware onto the uh, user uh, and visitor to that website, all the way to candy drops and things of that nature. But um, uh, moving into privilege escalation, escalating from, let's say, just normal user to an admin, from an admin to a domain admin, uh, and system level privileges to um, uh, then, of course, setting up shop to come back anytime you want with teachers and rats and pivoting and spreading to finding leveraging other, um, you know, pulling out hashes and passwords from the local system to try and gain access into systems that are nearby or on the local network, so pivoting and spreading. And then finally, figuring out, okay, what are we going to do at the end of the day with this data? Are we just pulling the data? Are we going to wipe the drives? I don't know if you saw a uh, recent uh, bit of malware, but that uh, has multi-platform. They, they'll actually wipe the drives on SunOS and HPUC and AIX and Linux as well as Windows. So it is now getting very multi-platform um, and uh, multi-vector uh, as well. So, you know, and when I look at this scope, um, the question is where do you affect the greatest risk? Um, and I think at a bare minimum, you look at all three. So look at reconnaissance. Try and prevent that reconnaissance from ever happening. Uh, there shouldn't be any vulnerabilities out there, right, for anybody to find. There shouldn't be any uh, private docs somewhere up on Google right, for doxing attempts. Um, and then look at penetration capabilities, right? You should never be able to go out to um, a, a website that's known compromised or uh, has a known problem. Um, you shouldn't be able to really escalate privilege. You should be able, you should be on a lockdown system. So look at access penetration countermeasures and finally really limiting the damage, uh, the, the amount of countermeasures you can put in this in place in this category are many, everything from network-based countermeasures to operating system to application to database, uh, you name it. Even into industrial control and embedded, uh, there are some capabilities that you can use to mitigate that risk. So when you go to hunt, I say look at at least these three core buckets as places to start. And we're going to talk more about the specific countermeasures at the end. Yeah, and actually, this is a good point, a good place to start talking about hunting. So th there's a lot of discussion about rats in uh, the context of APT, and and um, there's some misunderstanding of what a rat is. I think generally that I run into with most clients, it, it's a remote administrative tool. It's not necessarily malware. Uh, certainly, a lot of malware will replicate functions like remote desktop or reverse command shell um, or an FTP capability or reverse proxy. Um, those, those are more backdoors. They're still rats because they provide a remote administrative tool um, uh, capability, but they're not, uh, they're not um, the full extent of rats that should be uh, identified and you should be concerned about in the environment. Um, other rats exist like PS Exec or Windows Terminal Services or VNC, um, TeamViewer, um, and, and et cetera, utilities that are used by companies themselves. And most often um, what we find in the uh, investigations in, and especially in the last uh, three years, um, the attackers who are intent on persistent access and manipulation of your environment for 
extracting information that's valuable to them uh, move on very quickly from the Trojan backdoors because they're too easy to identify. Um, they move into making use of your own infrastructure rats, your own PS exec, command shell UNC um, path accesses, uh, your own VPN use, uh, your own Active Directory uh, credential management, SDCM, and so on. So in the context of rats, it's, it's important to consider what you use internally for remote administration, as well as um, thinking about the types of backdoors that can be used externally. Um, and uh, what you use is important to understand fundamentally so you can identify the anomalous use of those utilities. Um, it's easier to identify anomalous activity if you have an understanding than if you have to come in and investigate after the fact. There are some basic characteristics, and these are somewhat self-evident in a remote administrative tool. First of all, there must be a persistence mechanism in order to access it. Um, it must have privileges for use uh, at the level that you intend to use it or that the attacker intends to use it. Uh, it must have uh, the ability to call uh, the Windows kernel uh, functions from user space uh, uh, or in Unix uh, similar. Uh, it must be resident somewhere in the file system uh, or within a process uh, as, a, um, uh, as a temporary uh, residence. Uh, and it must have communication capability, uh, otherwise it doesn't have the remote capability. Not sure what just happened there. Bear with me. Yeah, I think we have okay. that. There we go. Okay. Um, so, so let's talk about where you can find a rat. So we're talking about hunting here. As I mentioned, I generally break down some of the stages into stage one, two, and three. The stage three are the persistent over time uh, management type backdoor activities that are occurring uh, with the targeting and exfiltration of data uh, or other manipulated use of the environment. Stage one and two are the, um, if you will, the user type um, exploit and compromise of the environment. It's the initial reconnaissance activities that occur. And we're most often today seeing those activities occurring uh, by the malware as a service operators uh, who then catalog those uh, compromised systems and make them available uh, to other uh, parties for the stage three activities. Uh, stage one and two are generally um, chatty as far as the file system artifacts, network artifacts, and so on, because they're most of the time going to come in through a user uh, space profile. So we'll mostly find um, the related binaries or scripts uh, dropped in a user space uh, directory like temp or app data uh, or temporary internet files under a user profile uh, because they've got to have a method of ingressing through a social engineering technique. So 95% of the droppers and downloaders that uh, we find in our investigations or through analysis and research actually drop into user space, either uh, mostly the uh, user space temp uh, file uh, and to a, a more limited degree into uh, an app data uh, directory. Um, so some advantages to knowing that is that uh, you can find link files often related to internet links that are sent in phishing email uh, or self-executing uh, uh, zip or 7z or the like uh, type of files. And those link files um, are under the profile name of the uh, account um, that initiates the, um, the compromise activity on the uh, local system. Um, you can find prefetches, um, unless you're on a server, uh, in uh, endpoints, uh, user endpoints, that can indicate uh, anomalous utilities or potentially unwanted programs, as they're called, which may be droppers or may be uh, proxy utilities like the uh, Hux proxy. Um, and uh, that can help you identify through daytime analysis that user profiles that provided the access or the method of ingress to the machine as well. Uh, compromised RAT utilities are usually for persistence scheduled under uh, Windows scheduled tasks or AT jobs. And we'll talk about AT jobs a bit because um, AT jobs, this method has been going back since at least 2002 and is um, still the number one preferred method used automatically by droppers to instantiate services as a system privilege. Um, 
and uh, largely uh, used by uh, manual uh, hacking techniques to gain uh, a, uh, a privilege exploit on a local Windows station where it's possible as well. But we'll talk yeah. about that more in a minute. Yeah, Shane, so we, of course, we did this, you know, in pretty much every single engagement, and we would automate it uh, in such a way that it was really invisible, and you could compile it to XE, basically creating the very early versions of this, but AT scheduling and adding jobs to escalate privileges have been around since uh, the Hills. Um, so th the challenge is that most people don't really go, to about, go about trying to prevent this type of technique. Uh, and there aren't very many countermeasures to do it. Right. Uh, then, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we're seeing renewed use of the startup folders as shortcuts for uh, persistence under profiles. And, um, and then, of course, the registry. The registry offers the best mechanism for persistence um, through the use of run keys. And they're relatively easy to identify um, uh, with just a little basic knowledge of the Windows registry. Uh, or the cron tab in Unix, uh, as they relate to a user profile space, uh, typically the user temp or app data folders. So profiling uh, uh, to detect uh, compromise or exploit rats uh, can be as simple as looking for non-standard uh, paths in the run keys in Windows registries uh, around your environment, looking for things that are not uh, programmed to a program files path uh, or potentially a um, uh, a utility path that's used by the enterprise as a whole. Uh, a quick rule of thumb when I'm surveying an environment for uh, quick detection is to see if there are any user space uh, profile paths in use uh, to call any binaries or scripts with run keys. Shane, we're running a little behind, so I know that there's some key stuff you want to, to touch on. Just feel free to jump around as, as you want. Will do. Yeah, so I'll jump through a couple of these pictures real quickly. Uh, since this is recorded, I, I'd encourage you to go back. Uh, you can see examples of each of the uh, demonstrative slides. Uh, here you've got an example of a dropper downloader where it's using a startup path um, with, uh, to masquerade a, a malware that's actually operating out of the uh, user temp space. Uh, it's easy enough to identify it by the discrepancy in the size between the uh, executable name in the user profile path and the valid executable. Uh, in the program file path. In the stage three, to some degree, it's even easier to identify rats. Uh, these are the persistent service DLLs that offer a backdoor Trojan type of remote administrative access to systems. 98%, um, maybe even more than that, uh, of the uh, backdoor Trojans that um, we've analyzed uh, through research or our own investigations uh, have a consistent pattern of, of identi uh, identifying features. Uh, number one, 98% uh, of them are located in the System32 or SysFile64 uh, system directories. Uh, they have no correlated cache copy. And many people don't realize that Windows uh, system uh, service DLLs and, and service binaries in general um, are cached on the Windows system in other folders as a method of maintaining um, consistent uh, um, uptime. Uh, and then a the third feature, or the three-legged stool as I call it, is um, that they're registered as a service DLL or called with a run key as a persistence mechanism. So if you've got, got a binary, a DLL or an EXE or possibly a sys file operating out of System32, that um, has no correlated cache copy, in other words, it's a single instance on a system, and it's registered under service DLL, uh, and typically it'll be under the net services hive uh, within the uh, Windows services, uh, you may want to look at that, especially if you can find through uh, a PID association between your task list processes and your net stats uh, that it's communicating. Um, on that point, uh, more than 99% of the service rat utilities, um, the backdoor Trojans, uh, make use of uh, communication resources. Uh, so the API calls through uh, W2, uh, WS232, the WinSock itself, NetAPI32, WinHttp DLL, and so on. Um, but we are seeing a reemergence of uh, path hijacking by uh, some malicious DLLs that will borrow uh, the API calls from other services. 
So just real quickly, I, I like to use a database method that we, we call Prespons, which allows us to uh, harvest uh, sets of artifacts from an environment, uh, whether it be 70, 100, 300,000 systems, doesn't really matter because it's all coming back into a SQL environment where we can do collateral uh, processing of the data to identify uh, patterns and um, anomalies through um, calculated uh, detection methods. Uh, here you see some RAT indicators uh, where we've got some anomalously named uh, service DLLs operating on System 32, um, or in this case hijacking a path by operating out of another uh, directory, in this case desktop tools. No cache copy of these uh, particular binaries by size and name. They're registered under uh, run keys or service keys in the Windows registry. And so they've got persistent capabilities. Uh, this is an example of a backdoor rat uh, in use. Um, it's a Windows pseudonym for a, a service DLL, RAS Auto 16, where the uh, uh, proper name would be RAS Auto for this particular service. We see it's registered in the Windows uh, service registry. Uh, we see it's running under sbchost.exe, which is another tip off um, these um, service DLLs operate uh, for persistence with an SVC host dash K call. And we see it has no uh, cache copy uh, when we do a dir uh, for that type of file name. Then coincidentally, I can also see that there are some prefetches that relate in uh, time to the use of this rat. Um, just digging in a little bit more, uh, there are a standard set of Windows service DLLs, um, generally, depending on which Windows version, there are roughly 34 standard Windows uh, service DLL names. And most often we see where backdoor Trojans are being used, that they'll use a name that's similar to a valid file, but different. And um, the, the list of valid service names uh, is expressed uh, in the uh, software hive. Um, the uh, key, there, it does include some legacy keys, and the legacy keys that are most commonly used are listed here, 6 to 4, IAS, IRMON, IPRIP, RAS Auto, et cetera. Um, I'm bringing this up because um, uh, I've seen some analysis of some malware that I've dealt with in uh, different investigations for clients, um, and uh, I've read some other research reports uh, where there's something of a mistake being made often on, uh, on the analysis. Many of today's uh, droppers will actually parse the available service keys from the software hive um, in order to identify an empty key socket in the uh, service registry. And then they'll make use of the first available empty socket. And so just because a piece of malware, call it uh, Comment Crew or Shady Rat or whatever, uh, uses 6 to 4 on one system doesn't mean that it does on another. It may use uh, IAS or IRMON. It's going to use the next available um, empty key slot. And that offers you an opportunity also for um, obstructing that type of dropper activity where um, that function in the malware uh, requires an empty slot. Um, you can remove uh, unnecessary legacy keys out of your software hive as an enterprise uh, build option. Uh, you can similarly then, um, or, or optionally, uh, drop in uh, dummy keys into those legacy keys or unused services in your services hive if you choose. Web rats are worth a mention because they're also coming back up in, in use. And I just did a quick timeline in 2005 to 2007, the preferred method of web rats was uh, C99, C, uh, R57, and the like, the PHP rats. 2007 to 2009 and, and 10, especially, we saw more use of uh, ASP rats. Uh, things like Redo, which is, a, is actually a, a useful commercial utility. Uh, so it's not necessarily malware, but it can be used maliciously. Um, WebShell, which there's a small example down here, is the most efficient uh, rat I've yet come across. That's the full client, uh, or if you will, the server uh, code that operates on the compromised web server. Uh, or ASPX5, which uh, got some 
attention a couple of years ago with the Night Dragon report. In uh, 2011 and since, we've seen more use of things like the JSP rats. Um, and it generally follows the most popular publishing servers uh, for web services out there. So talking about risks and threats in the context of hunting these advanced threats, um, risks um, I generally like to communicate with, with customers are indicators of compromise. Uh, you can identify potential risks by identifying malware uh, signatures, malware names, mutexes, etc. cetera, uh, by malicious or anomalous communications. Uh, risks are compromised computers that pop up in assessments and compromised user profiles. They're not necessarily threats, though. They're, they're risks until they're used in a way that can impact the business or the business themselves make a determination that they represent a threat. The threats um, in persistent threat activities are behavioral traits. It's the manipulated use of uh, or anomalous use of user profiles. Uh, it's manipulating the builds to change the configuration. Uh, and that means beyond just simple dropping of backdoor uh, Trojans or proxies or the like. Uh, it's the theft of valuable information, not just incidental system in, uh, information off of a system that got compromised and, and the rat automatically grabbed the uh, uh, system profile uh, directory uh, contents and uh, IP scheme, but actual targeted lateral movement through the enterprise to information stores that have a particular use or value in some point or time. And then a, another threat that uh, demands attention today is the potential for sabotage as a behavioral uh, trait. So going back to uh, our, our, our pre-spots method using a database to consolidate the information, here's an example of a drop or download or stage one or two uh, artifact where we see uh, we've got a communicating backdoor uh, rat service, Adobe ARM.exe, which we looked at a minute ago, and we see it's operating out of a local temp uh, directory. Uh, here's an example of a stage two reconnaissance utility where path hijacking is being used in a user context to gain escalated privileges. Uh, so we've got a malicious DLL that's borrowing the privileges, if you will, of a, of a service that's operating out of a non-standard path. And then here's uh, some examples of a Trojan backdoor uh, that offers a remote administrative utility that's registered as a service, is communicating, has persistence in the registry, and is registered as a uh, service DLL. And again, I, I know I'm going quickly through this, but as it's recorded, um, you're welcome to uh, review it at your convenience. Stage one, um, as I mentioned, uh, the phishing or social engineering. Here's a good example, a, a prefetch entry that shows an anomalously named uh, file that was executed, so it got a, a prefetch as a binary execution. Here we see a stage two uh, 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 indicator of a persistent service being used to uh, gain privileges. And then here we see actual stage three activity. This is a persistent uh, rat type use where we see not only uh, some indications of potential malware, but also the, the use of commands that are commonly used internally in an organization for remote administrative tasks. Um, we see the use of command, uh, netshell, ping. Um, we also see uh, in ver. We also see the use of some other uh, anomalous names, gsec dump, uh, hspvi, which is, by the way, uh, hux proxy, uh, gh, and, and so on. So there's a profile of activity indicated by the prefetches through the use of binaries for other purposes beyond just compromising a system. Um, here's an example from a recent uh, uh, investigation that I did. It's a good example. Um, here we do have a backdoor rat on this system. Uh, this one actually uh, does path hijacking. Um, but then we see subsequently um, user abuse. Uh, where user profiles, in this case, one's a service profile uh, used for service management around the organization. The other is an administrative user profile. They're being used to uh, do other activities, including lateral movement, using RDP, using PSExec, using WinSTP, and data exfiltration, using multi-part bars, 
uh, in this case, I was able, or we were able to uh, recover uh, the uh, RARs and uh, the batch script, which included the password, uh, which allowed us to see the actual files and determine where they came from. So again, there's uh, uh, not just persistent uh, backdoor rat existence here, but there's actual demonstration of uh, user abuse of profile, lateral movement in the environment, and exfiltration of targeted data. And that's an actual threat to an organization uh, once you've qualified with the company that that data has value and can therefore represent some kind of threat to the company. So real quickly, we mentioned persistent AT risk. It's so 2002. Part of the reason it's, uh, it's such a persistent risk is um, no matter what Microsoft has done, uh, they've still left some hard links into uh, function calls in um, operating system uh, uh, service DLLs. The kernel 32, ADV API 32, Net API 32, for example, each have hard link calls uh, built into uh, call the net schedule job add API, which, as you can see under this AT job, is um, the method of creating an AT job in Windows. AT jobs, fortunately, are today not commonly used by infrastructure managers, uh, so it can be relatively simple to survey an environment for AT uh, wildcard dot job tasks uh, and determine uh, potential dropper activity or other scheduled uh, tasks using that older mechanism. Um, for privilege escalation, we wrote a little utility if you will, uh, that we call uh, that escalated quickly, just to demonstrate um, that even if you can't uh, uh, use an interactive return to generate an AT job for uh, privilege escalation in Windows to go from a user or an admin to a system privilege, which is the super user privilege in Windows, uh, there are other mechanisms. In this case, uh, the utility that we wrote uses these two functions, uh, function calls, one is just an AT scheduler attack, very basic. If that fails, then it'll loop through uh, PIDs 1 to 5,000 to find a service that maybe isn't secured properly to the user. And then it'll uh, borrow that token in order to generate uh, the task and return, uh, for our purposes of demonstrating the uh, vulnerability, a command shell. Now, we could have returned anything, a PS exec or um, a RAT uh, otherwise, like Windows Terminal Service Connection. In this case, we, we thought we'd just return a command shell at the system privilege to demonstrate that we can gain system uh, interaction from a user profile. And here you see I'm, I'm running a net shell off the uh, system level privilege that I was able to gain with the scheduler attack. Uh, WMI is today a return to um, uh, old as a new attack vector. Uh, here on the left you see a RAT DLL uh, from a backdoor Trojan where they embedded um, a method to create a VB script that actually then calls um, through impersonating the, uh, the tokens of the service host privilege that it gained um, a WMI service in order to uh, 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 take residence in a, in a service. It's relatively easy to do, um, and it's being used more and more often. This is my favorite. Uh, uh, any auditor that comes into your environment uh, should be doing a DACLS type of audit uh, on your builds. Uh, discretionary ACLs are a uh, means of uh, defining uh, user access controls and access control lists, ACLs around the uh, services that you operate as an enterprise. Um, I found this uh, DACO check script online. It's very useful. I didn't see any need to modify it. And uh, I had a client run it on their local desktop. And you can see uh, they actually have one vulnerable service. Um, with the a D, no, a DACO's audit, um, you can identify, in this case, the McShield service or McAfee uh, AV service. Uh, was vulnerable, and you could borrow the token 
using a technique like the uh, one I just showed a minute ago in the short video. Then once the uh, system privilege is gained using that super user, you can go system to system or UNC or what other methods are available to you. Uh, that particular vulnerability was recognized uh, last month. So it's been around for a while, but it was recognized last month and it was patched. However, I, I do have a number of clients that uh, today are still susceptible to it, and that's what we call a single day because they've been unable to patch uh, due to framework restrictions or other build uh, constraints in their environment. DLL path hijacking is really not that difficult. Number one, you find a service binary, an executable that's commonly used like SCCM, uh, Galaxy Commvault, um, uh, or other types of services. You co-locate your malicious binary uh, into that path. Then when that service is uh, instantiated off of its standard scheduler function, uh, it will initiate the uh, connections or, or the uh, function calls that are built into that malicious DLL. So that binary then is impersonating the service privileges because it becomes used as a resource. And basically, it's just a, uh, if you will, a uh, forever day in Windows where um, the, the local path uh, is checked first for the function calls being borrowed from services uh, uh, resources. In other words, because WS232 is used by Portmon in this instance, uh, as a resource, uh, when Portmon executable makes a resource call to that Windows API that is run under WS232, it first checks the local path for the existence of that DLL, uh, and then it'll go over to the system path that is part of your path settings in Windows. We call it a forever day because it's one that hasn't been patched. There's a similar uh, persistent risk, uh, and this is unquoted paths, and I'm sure some of you have read about it. Uh, similar to the um, path vulnerability for uh, DLL hijacking, unquoted paths offer uh, another forever day in Windows. Uh, if you want to uh, execute a binary in a path that contains space in Windows, you need to use uh, quotes uh, to precede and post uh, or append uh, the, um, the command syntax. In this case, I, I'm showing a really simple uh, method. I, I copied a, uh, the Portmon executable as read 32 executable, and I put it into uh, the uh, base path on Windows, or the root, as program.exe. Then I run the uh, acroread.exe with a scheduler task without quotes, and so what actually gets uh, generated when that AT uh, task runs is uh, with system privilege, because I've got an interactive capability now, I'm borrowing that privilege as an escalation, I'm able to launch that executable uh, because I've um, obfuscated the access to the path by using that unquoted path vulnerability. Very simple and rudimentary and very widely used by attackers today. Okay, we only got a couple more minutes, so um, what do you want to kind of wrap up with and we can get into countermeasures? Yeah, so I've just got a couple of quick uh, slides that go right into the countermeasures. So um, was there anything you wanted to mention on the uh, kill chain real quick with us, Stu? Well, I think the big message that I always want to try and reiterate and remind everybody that, you know, the kill chain is not just about monitoring and detecting first, it's really, and then preventing, it's about finding that prevention before you monitor, um, so that you only monitor really what is getting through your prevention mechanisms. And I think too many people have been, kind of drank the Kool-Aid, if you will, to just do the monitor and detect uh, as part of that chain, really not elevate prevent into the first stage. So make sure that you focus and create your workflows around prevention you Absolutely. More than you believe. Yeah. Uh, on that point, a really simple um, uh, movement from just the monitoring and detect to prevent are things like HIPS uh, rules or um, tripwire type rules where you can, knowing that user temp space is used for binaries, you can prevent the execution uh, mm -hmm. as a HIPS rule of binaries from user temp. Uh, knowing that program.exe or documents.exe are commonly used uh, path exploits 
you can prevent the execution of those type of things as well. Those are ways you can move from detect uh, or just simply monitoring to the prevent phase of the kill chain. Yeah, exactly. Like take Aurora, for example. It was, the easiest way would have just been to remove the ability to execute in the internet temporary files, files folder. It would have prevented the whole bloody thing from occurring. Um, so yep. it's, it's frustrating for us as responders and, and those who are trying to help prevent when, when we can't do simple things like that, but it is a reality that uh, we've got to address. Yeah, now when we, uh, when we look in the uh, uh, detect and monitoring um, uh, as we're working with clients, we look at these different eight levels, if you will, the registry artifacts, uh, DNS use, network uh, settings in use, file system artifacts and methods, operating system configurations, services um, uh, history, uh, scheduler settings and privileges. And so I'm just putting into this page, again, just for your reference, I highlighted in yellow uh, some things that you can do to get uh, beyond just uh, monitor and detect and move toward that prevent phase. And this will help you address, as you see at the bottom, these exploits that I talked very quickly about, the service privilege hijacking, AT privilege uh, exploits, or unqu unquoted path exploits. It'll also help you get more generally beyond that to drop or download or uh, methods of exploiting the system uh, or um, persistent RAC capabilities to uh, maintain their persistence over time. Uh, a couple of quick uh, tips about Windows. Um, I know there's a lot of mystery about uh, the registry and Windows in general. It's not as complicated as it seems when you uh, step back and look at it. Services in Windows are prescribed. You can see the registry key here in the software hive where the uh, the available values to the build are specified. You can lock this down by removing some of these keys and prevent the use of legacy keys, um, which will also prevent the use of, um, of empty sockets in the service DLLs. Uh, there are a qualified set of service binaries that you'll find in your control set, uh, control set 001 or 002. As I mentioned, there's only about 34 valid uh, Windows service uh, DLLs. Now, sometimes enterprises will build unique DLLs, but you can whitelist those. And it's relatively easy to, to find those discrepant DLLs through HIPS rules or other types of tripwire type alerts. Uh, if you're using a bit nine or some other type of detective mechanism, you can whitelist the valid service DLL names and uh, look for alerts on anything else that's attempting to use those key spaces. Persistent mechanisms, there are only a few methods available in Windows. Startup folders, uh, scheduled tasks, the uh, registered service keys with a service host dash K, uh, or auto runs in the keys mentioned here. So what do you need to do? Um, now I mentioned IOCs, uh, indicators of compromise, uh, can help you identify risks. IOC technology is important. AV is important. FireEye, Mandiant, uh, Bit9. Uh, even Silence, some products that uh, we're bringing out. Those are important because indicators of compromise can help you identify risks before they become threats or help you identify risks that need to be qualified as threats. And threat, uh, I'm sorry, risk identification is very important. But you need to assess those risks according to their use and what impact they might have by understanding their past history of use. Um, in order to detect threats, you really got to look at behavioral technologies, things that put together the picture of the use uh, of the systems that have been compromised or the credentials that have been compromised in your environment. So SAM, KD profile methods and, and logs, net monitors, uh, the silence pre-response uh, method, uh, and so on. You want to look at the behavioral abnormalities of the use of profiles uh, or the use of other administrative tools in your environment. And they will stand out if you take the time to baseline uh, and understand who typically does what, because no organization out there has very many security technologists employed. I don't care if you're Shell Oil, uh, Toyota Information Systems, or Microsoft. There are just not that many people managing the security aspects of your network. And so the anomalous use of their profiles and the anomalous use of the profiles that they use to support service management are, rel uh, are going to stand out because there are relatively few of those. Similarly, anomalous uh, methods of communicating between systems and tools that are used will stand out because, again, 
if you take the time to baseline those activities, there really are not that many that are fundamentally in use. So know your build, know your network activities, and know your user activities. Then it's really important to establish a dialogue with management so that they understand what you're talking about. To differentiate between those risks that you talk with your peers about, the uh, malicious IPs and FQDMs and, uh, and MD5s. I, I don't think I've ever met a CFO in any company, large or small, that understands what an MD5 sum means or really can appreciate uh, that purpledaily.com has been used in a variety of uh, advanced persistent threat activities over the past five years. Yeah, you do need to be able to translate it to get action without right. a doubt. Talk about the threat, talk about the threat activities. So lot, let's just wrap up here because I know we're way over time already. I appreciate everybody sticking around. You know, there are some final recommendations to remember. Things like, of course, just try and patch as quickly as you can. Try and eliminate the privilege that you can in your environment. Create a least privileged environment where only the bare minimum level of privileges are given out to users. Um, you know, remove simple shares, execution control with things like whitelisting or app locker, um, UACs, disable unnecessary services, like Shane was talking about, and certainly some of the loads of certain services. And then filter a lot of the ports. I mean, a lot of the attacks that can be done over the network can be easily blocked um, just by, by filtering on known uh, source IP. So with that, I think, uh, you know, some other resources for you, Twitter, of course, YouTube channel. If you want to go to our uh, Hacking Exposed Live YouTube uh, channel, that's where you'll get these recordings uh, from. And um, uh, finally, just uh, remember we are a new company, new startup here in um, California. But uh, think of us for um, any engagements that you deem appropriate. Uh, right now we'll just take really just a couple of quick questions because I know everybody's running late. I think one of the questions we had was around uh, is Windows 7 vulnerable to AT job escalation. Um, and I know with the uh, Windows 7, uh, with I think with UAC, I don't know if it actually does. Do you know if it silently does that, allows it for AT job uh, for t uh, escalation? So, so the short answer is yes, it is susceptible. Um, the, uh, the same binary that I demonstrated quickly in that uh, short video uh, will um, escalate to system privilege in Win7. Um, uh, right now it uh, returns a splash screen, but um, the longer answer is um, uh, the uh, malware that we've seen uh, dropping in Win7 is able to get around the UAC controls uh, either by borrowing um, privileges from a susceptible PID through uh, poor DACLs, for example, uh, or using other exploits as they come out. So we're continuously reading about and experiencing these new Java Day exploits or, or other application exploits. So that's certainly one vector where they're able to uh, piggyback on other privileges of services or apps. Um, the other more common one that we're seeing, though, is the, uh, the DACLs exploits by automating an audit of ACLs and then uh, borrowing those privileges as a piggyback technique. Last question, Shane. With regard to non-Windows rats, what have you come across? Well, actually in Linux uh, in, in general Unix um, and to some extent in, in Mac, uh, although we're not seeing a lot of, of backdoor rats in Mac, uh, we are seeing reverse proxies um, and we are seeing um, some backdoor rats with DNC type of capabilities built in. Okay. All right. Well, listen, everybody, thank you so much for joining. Appreciate for those of you who stayed late. Keep an eye out for the next session, and we always take input, so please send in your ideas. We'd love to try and uh, help you out. All right. Thanks again, everybody. We'll see you next time.